Let's stand together and put our hands together this morning. just bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that with you, Lord, all things are possible. And we give you praise and worship today. You alone are worthy to be praised, Lord. We pray for Casey today as he is over in the Middle East with one of his friends for several weeks, Lord. I just pray your your hand upon him, your safety upon him, Lord. And I pray for our time today together that you would just be present here with us, Lord, that we would sense your presence And know that we have been in your presence today, Lord, while we have been in this place. We worship you today, Lord. You alone are holy. You alone are worthy. We give you praise. Amen.
altars are open if you'd like to come and pray. We'll just take a moment to, to quiet our hearts and our minds. Father, Creator, we once again come before you, and in this moment, we, we thank you for life. For as I have come to understand, breath in and of itself is a mirror. for the sunlight, the cool, brisk air, the fresh new life all around as spring is bursting forth. Father, we celebrated resurrection last week. But let's not just celebrate it for one day. Father, we should celebrate resurrection every day. The fact that we have hope and peace and love because you came to earth in the form of your son to show us what a true centered relationship is all about in you, to show us power that unconditional love has. And we thank you for that. Father, I think as we, as a, as a nation, as a world, celebrated Earth Day, Father, again, I, I want to thank you for creation. And Father, you, you teach us to, to sow beauty and and to, to sow new life into people. And Father, may we honor that. May we honor humanity. May we honor, may we honor our world. May we honor creation the way we should. Father, I think that's part of our responsibility. Father, we should not be people of destruction or pollution. but people of love. And so, Father, again, I just thank you. Father, I know each person comes in here today with things that are on their heart, good things, bad things, in between things. And Father, one of the hardest things we do is, and one of the hardest things we struggle with is that surrender peace, that, that peace of vulnerability. And, and Father, I just pray that, that each person here today, whatever it is, may they surrender it to you. May they find the strength that comes with that. And Father, we, we ask that uh, your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, be with us as we continue to journey in this time together as we celebrate together as the body of Christ. And we pray this in the name of your resurrected son, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to have Matt stay up here for just a minute today with us. Some of you may have noticed that he has a suit on and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> an actual applause. I asked him if he would wear this, but Friday night he didn't have the option. He had to wear it because he was being ordained as an elder in the Church of the Nazarene, and that is the highest level that you can receive of your education, 
and your acceptance. You have to go before different boards and, and uh, talk about your theology and about your uh, beliefs and your doctrines, and uh, you have to have the education. And we were really proud of Matt. It was a very nice ceremony. You girls were there and were able to see that, a powerful ceremony, a powerful service. And I just wanted you to know that uh, that happened with Matt. Uh, this past weekend, and uh, let's just give him a nice round of applause and show him our encouragement on that, and, uh, and we expect Matt, yes, all right, thank you, we expect Matt to, uh, to have the suit on every week now that he's ordained, just like uh, his uh, mentor, uh, Pastor Mark does, right, yeah, <laughs> no, I won't ask you to do anything I won't, I'm not willing to do, thanks Matt, God bless you, man. Good morning. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. And I'd like to ask the ushers if they come up at this time. Uh, they pass out the booklets. Just set it on your seat when you're done. But let's uh, pray for our offering this morning. Dear Jesus, we're thankful to be here today. We're just thankful for the way that you work and the things that you do. Thank you for the opportunity to give back. Just a little of the way that you take care of us. May we always glorify your name and the things that we do, and may we always strive to further your kingdom. In your name, amen. Coming off our Easter week, we have a, just a couple things going on today that I want to remind you, but please keep uh, um, reading your emails that you get from us, but that you have the opportunity to give online each week, and actually a lot more people are doing that. And also, if today you could just... Um, look at the stage, like we, we switched from Easter real quick, and we have some talented people here, and it's talking about being complicated, and if any of you are good at math, I, I know that there's a math teacher in here, so if you, you can work on the board a little bit and see that, but this is a message series that would be great for you to bring your friends, and to be part of it, just to hear about what God is doing in the early church and what he's doing in our church. So I'm going to leave you with those couple things. Please be reading your emails because there's a couple things coming down the road in the next couple weeks. I'm excited about this, uh, this new series that we are beginning. And uh, we have been coming up with sermon after sermon from the book of Acts that we can use as scriptural references and scriptural uh, content for these different areas of life that are complicated. And uh, we all know, we've been around enough in this room that, that, that life gets complicated. It seems like we're trying to juggle a hundred things at the same time. We can't even keep three things juggled at the same time, but it seems like we've got to keep a lot of of plates spinning on those sticks like you see sometimes, but it wasn't any different for the early church. Immediately after the death and resurrection of Christ, life became very complicated for the followers of Christ. We see these complications surfacing again and again in this book of Acts. And uh, I want to talk just a minute about the book of Acts. Um, in our Bible, it's, it's the book that follows the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the next, very next book is the book of Acts. So if you ever want to read the story of Christ and the early church in chronological order, start in the book of Luke and just go straight through and read right into the book of Acts because Luke was actually the author of both of those books, the Gospel of Luke, makes sense, but he also wrote the sequel, which is called Acts. And the book of Acts paints a picture for us. It shows us how the very first church began and developed. And uh, we can kind of look at our church or the church in the United States of America or the church in other parts of the world and kind of see what have, we, what have we continued to do that the early church did? What have we changed? How can we get back to some of the things the early church did? Because this book shows us how the church began. There are several key characters found in this book of Acts in our scriptures. One of them is, uh, is Peter, Simon Peter, who was a key character in the last part of Luke's, Luke's story of Jesus. We see uh, the incredible story of a man named Saul, 
and his personal encounter with Jesus Christ that changed his life forever. And for that matter, what's interesting is Saul and his encounter with Christ actually changed our lives today because Saul became Paul, or the Apostle Paul, wrote much of our New Testament in the form of letters to churches. In fact, on Easter Sunday last week, we actually used scriptures from the Apostle Paul's writing. So there's two people, Peter and Paul, that are primary characters in the new church as it's developing. And then another character was introduced in the scriptures. And that third identity has actually been around for a very long time, since the very beginning. But he was introduced in a new way, in a new form, a new format, if you will. And that new character that was introduced in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We know we have God the Father. We know God the Son and Jesus Christ. But God the Holy Spirit, who was actually present from the beginning, was introduced in a different way in the book of Acts. All these different things took place right after Christ's death and resurrection. We also have many other names and faces and situations and circumstances and issues. And as the early church begins, we can see how quickly life became complicated for those Christ followers. And that's what this series is all about. It's complicated. Life gets complicated. And even though many years have passed, a lot has changed. Technology has changed. Industry has changed. But humanity hasn't changed that much from back those years ago in the beginning with the early church. And because of that, I think that a lot of times we can find ourselves right in the story, which is exciting. We can find ourselves, we can put ourselves right in the story of the early church because the same complications that people faced in that day, we still face today as Christ followers as a church. So I want to jump right into this week's complication. So for this first week, new series of messages called When Life Gets Complicated, and I want to introduce what I believe is the first complication that the early church, that the disciples, that the Christians encountered. And I call it the now you see him, now you don't complication. Now you see him, now you don't. And as we begin, may I suggest to you that I believe that every one of us in this room has and will continue to experience and face this complication as we follow Christ. The more we get to know Christ, the more we'll see that this is true. Now you see him, now you don't. Here's some examples. Early church. Now you see him. They saw him, Jesus on the cross, Jesus placed in the tomb. But now you don't. Because the women at the tomb could not find the body. Now you see him. Two of them, after walking on a road called Emmaus, he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he began to give it to them, and look what it says. Then their eyes were open, they recognized him, now we see him, now we don't. He disappeared from their sight. Now you see him again. While they were still talking about this, this was another time, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you, but now you don't. Because while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And it didn't stop in Luke's first book about the life and teachings of Jesus. It continued in the sequel, the book of Acts. In fact, Luke says to us that Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And he spoke about the kingdom of God. He wasn't with them that whole time. He would appear, and then he would disappear again. And it didn't take long for life to get complicated for those early disciples. Because can you imagine this? They started following this great teacher. They believed that the great teacher was the Son of God. They saw his miracles. They saw his signs. And they even began to realize, hey, if we follow this man, we're going to face persecution. We're going to face some problems. Maybe even death. And for a month and a half, 40 days, you're just in constant confusion. Is he there or isn't he? Well, he was here a minute ago. Now he's gone again because now you see him and now you don't. He's there. He's in person. And then he's gone again. And can you imagine how complicated that must have been and how frustrating that must have been for the early believers, for the disciples? 
What if they wanted to ask him a question? Would he be there or, or would he not be there that day? What if they simply wanted to spend some time with him and, and talk about the old times and talk about what they were supposed to do next? Well, maybe Jesus was there and they could spend some time with him. Maybe they couldn't because he wouldn't be there. They just have to hope that maybe he'd come back for a little while and maybe he would stay this time. And what if they wanted to just sense God's presence? What if they just wanted to sense Jesus there with them, and yet he seemed so far away from them? What if they just wanted to sense his presence, but he seemed so far away, and all of a sudden, here we are, right in the middle of this story. I met with someone this week who was hurting very badly, wanted to just sense God's presence. But God seems so far away. God seems so unfair and unjust. And I could relate to this person while they were talking to me because I've been there before. I know what it feels like. I think probably many of you know what it feels like too. You want to sense God's presence. You need God with you. But he seems so far away. You just want to be with Jesus, but where is he today? I saw him yesterday. I, I felt his presence last Sunday in the service, but, but now I don't know where he is. See, we don't see him physically like the early believers did. But we certainly see Jesus figuratively. We see Jesus symbolically. I, I want you to think about some of the things that we say. We'll say something like, man, I could really see God's hand at work in that situation. Or God is really moving. He's doing wonderful things in our church. Or I know God protected me the other day when that guy pulled out in front of me. I know God protected me. I could sense his presence in that service. Or I could sense his presence as I was worshiping him that morning or reading my Bible. I could just sense God there. We say those things because we see him, not physically, but figuratively, symbolically. We see him. But we also know that sometimes we don't see him. So that now we see him, now we don't, it works. <laughs> it's our life. And so we'll say something like, well, God just seems really far from me right now. I, I feel like my prayers, I, I pray, but I don't feel like anybody's listening. I feel like they're hitting the ceiling and just coming back. I didn't get a thing out of that service today. I didn't get a thing out of the Bible reading I've been doing. I went to a small group, and everybody seemed like they were getting something out of it, but I didn't get anything out of it. So where is God now? Because I need him. Now you see him. Now you don't. And it wasn't just a life complication for the early church. It's, it's very real in our life. And it makes life complicated for us as followers of Christ when he's there sometimes and then he's not there sometimes. This is a two-point sermon. It's really, really easy. It's easy to remember this. Here's the first point. We learn that sometimes we see him and sometimes we don't. It doesn't take us long as we're walking with Christ, as we're journeying with Christ, when we begin to follow him and, and, and understand him, it doesn't take us long to know and learn that sometimes we see him and sometimes we don't. That's the first point of this whole sermon. Our lives will become a lot less complicated when we grasp that. It, maybe we don't want to accept it, but when we understand that it's a truth, our lives become less complicated as Christ followers. It's because sometimes we see God's hand at work in our lives, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we sense and feel God's presence, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we know God is working and moving in our life situation, sometimes he doesn't seem to care at all. So that's the first point, very simple. We learn that sometimes we see him and sometimes we don't. Here's point number two. God is always there. That's it. God is always there. 
Okay, we, we learn that sometimes we see him and sometimes we don't. But hey, here's the second point of the sermon. This is the good news one, that God is always there. We may not see him figuratively, symbolically. We may not feel him or sense his presence, but God is always there. Our relationship with God is not based on our feelings and our sensations. And I'm glad for that because sometimes I don't feel good. Physically, I don't feel good. Emotionally, I'm exhausted. And if I went by my feelings all the time, it would seem like God was far away much of the time. But our relationship isn't based on our feelings or, or, or our emotions that day. Our relationship with God is based on facts, and it's based on faith, not our feelings. Maybe you've heard this simple little illustration before. It's been helpful to me over the years. There's three, three guys sitting on a wall, one, one two, and three. Uh, one there, uh, his first name was Fax. His middle name was Scripture. <laughs> Fax, Scripture. I don't know what his last name was. Number two, he was Faith. His name was Faith. So we have Fax, we have Faith. And then number three, his name was Feelings. And as the story goes, one time, feelings began to, to slip and began to slide and began to fall off of that wall. And he reached out his hand and he said, help me, Faith. Help me, Faith. Faith said, oh, yes, I can help you, feelings. And he grabbed onto feelings and pretty soon the two of them began to slide together off that wall and they reached back grasping for help and asking facts to help them out. Well, facts was strong. Our word of God is our foundation. It holds us together when nothing else can. When our faith is weak, when our feelings are all over the place, it's the facts of Scripture that hold us firm, strong. And facts reach over and pull both faith and feelings right back up on that wall so neither one fell off, neither one got hurt. All three of them were back on the wall where they began. And here's the facts that are based in Scripture, that are based in the Word of God. The facts are that we are a child of God. We're a child of God. That's a fact. A fact is that we're saved by grace. It's not the things we do to be good enough for God because that'll never work. It's, it's God's grace. It's a, it's a gift that we don't earn. That's a fact. The fact is that we're loved by Christ. We talked last week about Christ's death on the cross and how he expressed his love to us in such a mighty way. Those are the facts. Now, it does take our faith, it takes our belief to accept these facts that are found in Scripture. And then we have our feelings. We can't deny that people have feelings. We have emotions. And that our feelings are neither right nor wrong. We can't control our feelings. We can control how we act on our feelings. And the feelings are not what we can use to establish our relationship with God. If we count on our feelings to establish our relationship with God, that's not going to work. We have to count on our faith and our belief. And sometimes that even gets weak and struggles and that's when we have to go back to the facts again that God is always with us always there never leaves us never forsakes us several weeks ago I challenged you to break the scriptures into three sections I wanted you to try the Old Testament the New Testament and then create a new section in the middle using the Psalms and Proverbs and I've actually had a couple people just this past week who have said to me hey I tried the thing you were talking about or I'm doing the thing you're talking about but listen to this reading from my psalm just this past week. This is interesting. It wasn't a part of anything when I was planning this series of messages or this particular topic about seeing God and not seeing God, seeing Christ and not seeing him. This was my psalm this week. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. I believe the psalmist is saying, God, I just am seeing you all over in creation, in, in nature. I, I can tell you're real. I can tell you're alive. All this stuff is happening. 
It's an incredible description of experiencing God. God's power on display. But look at the very next verse. This is what's interesting. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock. You see, God was leading his people. He was leading them. I believe this is a clear reference to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, where God was leading his people out of slavery, out of Egypt. And they came to the water. They had the army behind them. They came to the water, and God led them right through the Red Sea, through the mighty waters. But look what the psalmist says. Your footprints could not be seen. Now, we've all heard the poem about the footprints, and, well, Jesus was carrying them, and that's why you only saw one set of footprints. That's not what this is talking about. That's a great poem. I don't know if it's based on Scripture or not. This is something completely different here. God was clearly leading the people through the waters. He brought Moses and Aaron to lead them through the waters. But guess what? The psalmist says, we couldn't see. We couldn't see you there. I think they were probably so terrified of the walls of water. I think they were probably so terrified of the Egyptian army behind them. They were in the midst of a crisis, and they could not see the footprints of God. They could not see him there. And life was complicated for them, just like it's complicated for us sometimes. When we can't see God's presence, we can't see his footprints leading us. We can't see his footprints carrying us. We can't see his footprints behind us because it seems like God isn't there. And so we have to remember these two simple things today as we close. The first one is that we learn. We learn as we follow Christ that sometimes we see him, sometimes we don't. But thank the Lord for point number two. This is the one that extends the grace of God to us once again and gives us hope today as we leave that God is always there. Always there. That's the fact. It takes our faith, it takes our belief to, to, to accept that fact. Sometimes we feel it and it's great. Sometimes we don't feel it. But that's the fact that God is always there. It's based on God's word and the scripture that he will never leave us he never forsakes us. We may walk away from him, but God doesn't walk away from us. Let's bow today for prayer. You know, Lord, you've created us. You know us in our deepest thoughts, at our deepest level. You know us, you love us, you care for us, Lord. And you know that our life is very complicated sometimes as individuals. Sometimes our life as a church gets really complicated. So, Lord, help us as we walk with you. Help us to learn from you that there's times when we see you, Lord. But there's times when we don't see you. And in those times, Father, when we see you, we just rejoice in those times, Lord. We, we worship you. We, we feel closer to you. We sense your presence in a greater way. And, and we're grateful for those times, Lord, where you're right there with us. But what about the times when we don't see you, Lord? Just, I pray your blessing on your people today. I pray your blessing on me as your pastor, Lord, that shepherds this flock, Lord. I just pray, oh God, that in the times when we don't see you, help us, Lord, to remember that second point. The, the fact is, Lord, that you are right there with us. We may not see you. We may not feel you. We may not sense you're there behind us or in front of us or all around us, Lord, but help us to, to rely on the facts of your word that rings so true to us today that you are there, Lord. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Bless us with that truth today as we go through this week. May we see you, and in the times when we don't see you, may we know that you're with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. You are dismissed.